Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Where am I? Oh, there I am. Hello. Hello, Mr. Real. How are you doing? Uh, I just, I was messaging you a few minutes ago. I just got done doing a marriage ceremony less mm. than an hour ago. Somebody called me late notice today. Uh, in fact, Spencer Wright, if you're, if you're watching, I forgot to call you back because I got that call to do this, but uh, went and did a, a marriage today and I'm amazed at how easy it is to enter a marriage. First off, I'm untrained. All I did was put my name on a list and I'm a, a wedding officiant. And I show up at the house. I, I get the marriage license out. Both the bride and the groom sign their name. The witnesses sign in print. I sign in print. And then I say, you know, a paragraph of words. They both say I do. And now if they want to untangle that tomorrow, it's going to be a whole hell of a lot harder. Yes, it is, isn't it? And that's where <laughs> lawyers come into play. That's why you're trained and I'm not. Yeah, well, like I say about marriage in general, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. <laughs> Life is good. How are you doing? Well, great. Oh, I just I wanted it... to say, oh. I agree with RFM. <laughs> <laughs> I, there we go. Honestly, I have friends who have been married more than once who are like, you you had the right idea. Keep if it going. Those friends now know that you're definitely talking about them. <laughs> no, I have more than one friend who, um, who has, has a crappy marriage. More than once. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. One's the husband, I'm, I'm one's the wife. I'm not even that old, but yeah. My, uh, my father-in-law told me you could marry more money in 10 minutes than you could make in a lifetime. Hmm. But he waited till after I married his daughter to tell me that. <laughs> that guy. What hey, a guy. By the way, of speaking course. Our... Of, oh, yes, yes. Oh, I was just going to say, speaking of, um, Bill and Amanda are both very important people, i.e., VIPs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Gene was just in the chat saying that he's got his uh, tickets to the Mormon Stories VIP event with you. So just wanted to do a quick plug for that. And I will. Find the link for that real soon, and I'll put that in the chat. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there so it you is. Can see is that about there. sold out? Uh, I don't know that it's sold out. I don't know that I'm going to sell anything out other than, like, you know, maybe me and my friends on a buffet or something. But Oh, uh, you are too modest, <laughs> good sir. <laughs> Donorbox.org slash events slash 455119. We'll be in Alpine, Utah uh, this coming week. Uh, we'll leave, actually, this Sunday uh, afternoon, get there maybe 4.30, 5 o'clock in Salt Lake City. And I'll be in the Salt Lake City Alpine area all of Monday and Tuesday. One of those days will be a sit down with John DeLynn for multiple hours. Again, I'm, I've got a few stories that I think will be interesting. But uh, Tuesday night, uh, John's been gracious. Why does that make me nervous? I don't, well, yeah, so you've I mean, never told before, you said, right? Yeah, I mean, I again, the night I spent that? in jail as a seven-year-old. Uh, oh, that's is right. One. <laughs> you've got a great story about Maven, too, that hasn't been told. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna share that one. I'm, I'm really big on sharing other people's sacred stories. Yeah, and that's a big thing for me. Um, Tuesday night we'll have the special. Uh, it'll be a VIP dinner at 6 p.m. Uh, and then seven o'clock a general uh, kind of presentation and Q and A. Uh, Thirty bucks for the VIP dinner, ten dollars for the the general event. And I really hope, folks, if if you like the work I've done over the last decade, I really hope that uh, you'll show up. Support us, and uh, John's been gracious enough that he'll donate all of those uh, funds to Mormon Discussion Incorporated. So, super excited. Bravo. I think that's wonderful. Anything Quick else, question. Maven? Oh, go ahead. I don't think so, other than um, Exmo shirts for merch. Yep. And I'll throw somewhere <laughs> along the way, I'll throw the uh, mailing list subscriber uh, link up. Uh, RFM, I approached you probably four or five days ago. We don't give each other a whole lot of prep sometimes on, on the stuff we do. We put outlines out a little late, which 
makes Maven kind of a superhero out of the three of us for helping to put things together. But uh, when I came to you about four or five days ago and said, okay, this week we are going to talk about how the church changed its name mm. uh, since its yeah. inception. And what was, what was kind of the first thoughts you had as, uh, as I gave you the topic for this coming week? You mean before, before or after I regained consciousness? Well, let's go before and after. Like, what did you, <laughs> like, what did you think? <laughs> what? What was, you're going to talk about what? Yeah. And you immediately called up some of your uh, intellectual friends and uh, started mm -hmm. to plot out, like, how the hell can I make this topic interesting? But then yeah. I told you what it was we were going to share at the end of tonight's show. Yes. And I'd love to know what, what shifted or moved for you. Uh, in that well, process. What shifted or moved for me, and I want everybody to know this right now, that we're going to have a lot of good, fun information about the name of the church. But if it seems tedious, and I don't think it will, but if it does, hang in there because we have got Bafo box office bombshell at the end of the show. And really, everything else is structured around this bombshell. It is amazing that something as subversive was said by a president of the church in general conference in my lifetime. Yeah. And I and actually heard it. And you know the talk. Well, let me put it this way. I know the talk for one reason, but there was something said in that talk that I had never seen and still could not believe it. Bill is, we're talking on the phone, right? Bill's reading me the script of the talk that's on the church's website. And I'm going, no way. He did not say that. <laughs> and I said, Bill, I got to hang up with you right now because I got to pull this up and play. I got to hear him say this. And I did. And he said it. I just went, what on earth just happened? Yeah. And it was in 19, it's 33 years ago. And I never saw it before. I'm not aware of anybody else ever seeing this before. But after you have seen it, which you will tonight, you will never forget it. <laughs> in fact, I've sent it on to Craig Stapley. I'm hoping it'll become a missed in Sunday school meme. Uh, I think it certainly has the quality to do that. So if there's nothing else, I'll... Uh, one other I'll thing. Just oh, one please. other thing. Please, please. I just want to tell you... Oh, first off, my t-shirt. Is there still any discussion about my t-shirt? Does anybody care about my t-shirt? Does that I have just... a white collar or are you wearing garments under that? It's... it. This is... Um, this The collar is part of the shirt. But there may or may not be marks in the shirt that you can't see because of the crazy design that's going on. Because you've got the Hulk there, and he's fighting with... The Thing. Yep. V very good, Bill. The thing. the thing. So you recognize the Marvel characters, and I wanted to tell you that I really appreciate the influence I'm having on you. That you came up with this show, the idea, and the title, What's in a Name, and you actually quoted William Shakespeare for the title of this show. I was so and, proud of you. And, and unknowingly. <laughs> and unknowingly, unknowingly. See, this is how this is how much Shakespeare's come into our modern day parlance. And I will tell you, of course, what's in a name that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And what plays that from, Bill? Um, I'm going to go with uh, Hamlet. Romeo and Juliet. Home Romeo and Juliet. There you go. There you go. Sweet. For future reference. But you were close. I'll remember it next time. <laughs> I know you will. But we're ready for the show tonight. We're going to have a great time, and I'm going to let Bill start off, and uh, I will wait to be cued by him. Sweet. So here we go. So first, I'm going to show a picture here. This is the depiction that you saw in church uh, from those. I remember going into the Ward Library and having the, the picture gospel art kit, you know, and you could pull this one out. The church in the last few years has really updated a lot of its artwork, but this was the one that I would have seen multiple times. You would have seen multiple times uh, throughout lessons. This was the April 6th, 1830. Uh, <laughs> this pronounced. That's good. Um, this was the April 6, 1830 organization of the church with the six signatures, which was the formal requirement there in New York. Um, what we wanted to talk about here is how the name of the church originated, how it changed. And then we'll spend a little time in the end uh, talking a little bit about the word Mormon and how that's been used. But Church of Christ, the Church of Christ was the original name of the Latter-day Saint Church founded by Joseph Smith, organized informally in 1829 in upstate New York, and then formally on April 6, 1830. By the way, RFM brought this to my attention. There is disagreement, but the prevailing opinion is that this occurred at the Whitmer home. It was the first, um, this was the first organization, by, by that I mean the LDS Church, to implement the principles found in Smith's newly published Book of Mormon, because there were breakoffs after, and thus its establishment represents the formal beginning of the Latter-day Saint movement, 
The church was known by this name from 1830 to 1834. And just to note what RFM brought to my attention earlier, the 1833 Book of Commandments gives Manchester rather than Fayette as the location uh, for the organization of the church. And this is in DNC 21, the original. Though the prevailing history of the church and a manuscript found in the First Presidency's vault called the Book of Commandments and Revelations gives the setting for DNC 21 as Fayette, thus sustaining the traditional account. Uh, so there's that. And this is courtesy of a phone call I had with Dan Vogel on Monday, who told me about this as well as other things that I went to research. I also want to bring up that Brent Metcalf was also invaluable in his assistance, who told me a bunch of cool things and then suggested I call Dan, which I did. So some of that will be coming up tonight. But Bill, the thing that's amazing to me is that as you have pointed out, there is no spiritual, fundamental, miracle kind of story that's foundational to the LDS church that does not have problems when you look at it closer and have all the evidence, whether it's the translation of the Book of Mormon or the restoration of the priesthood or anything, they all end up not being simple, plain and straightforward once you start digging into it. What shocks me is that something as mundane and pedestrian and quotidian as the place the church was organized, even that is a subject of some controversy. Yeah. And I'll let you jump in here and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, third Nephi and the Mosiah and stuff. But I, I want to set it up by saying that you and I, when, you know, I joined the church again in 1995, 96, and you joined, joined the church in 1978. I know that because that's the year I was born. And oh, uh, thanks. Well, sorry. That's just the sure. way I remember it. <laughs> and uh, you and that's I both insane. went through so many church lessons where we were told how important the name of the church was and how revelation was given that laid out the name of the church. And as we'll see tonight, it just isn't as straightforward as they told us. And we'll start to explain here the reasons kind of behind that. But RFM, take us through kind of what the scriptures say about, and for, for the reason for why Joseph Smith calls it originally the Church of Christ. Okay. So when we read section 20, I think it's the very first verse, the two revelations, 20 and 21, that were given the day the church was organized formally on April 6, 1830. It just says the Church of Christ. There's no discussion about it. It enters the stage at that time fully blown as this is the name of the church, and we don't need any further discussion. So what I found out that I did not know is that in June of 1829, a year before, the church was informally organized at that time. And if anyone is familiar with the contents of Section 20, the Articles and Covenants of the Church is what it was originally called. Now we usually just call it Section 20. But it has the, the method of baptism, the method of ordination, uh, the sacrament prayers, all these kinds of building blocks and things that are essential. It's like a, a user's manual for the new church. Basically, all of that had been done before in a different form in June of 1829. And one of the things that's remarkable about it is that this is not a revelation that was received by Joseph Smith in June of 1829. It's a, it is a revelation that was received by Oliver Cowdery. And I'm not saying Joseph Smith received it for Oliver Cowdery. I'm saying Oliver Cowdery received it from the Lord in the same way that Joseph Smith would have announced his revelations. And what happened here is that Oliver Cowdery basically does the same thing. Okay, now if we can back up just a second to ask the question, why didn't Joseph Smith receive a revelation about the organization of the church? There it is, the rise of the Church of Christ, DNC 20, verse 1. So, and then, oh, and it does say portions of this revelation may have been given as early as summer 1829. Well, it doesn't say what that means, but that's the revelation that was given through Oliver Cowdery. Okay, so why is he receiving a revelation in the summer of 1829 about the organization of the church? Well, it may be, it may have something to do with the fact that in March of 1829, Joseph Smith had received a revelation from God, which is now found in section five of the Doctrine and Covenants. But in that revelation that he received, it says that Joseph Smith shall have no other gift than translating. 
And I don't know if we have that slide or anything of the manuscript. Oh, beautiful. So here's the actual revelation from the Joseph Smith Papers Project from March of 1829, just a few months before, where it says um, he has, Joseph Smith has no power over them. Or wait a second, except I grant it unto him. And he has a gift. This is Joseph Smith. He has a gift to translate the book. And I have commanded him that he shall pretend to no other gift, for I will grant him no other gift, period. So if Joseph Smith has no other gift, then maybe that's why it is that Oliver Cowdery has to receive this revelation in the summer of 1829. Now, in the first book of commandments, well, the only book of commandments, 1833, the first collection of the revelations, this got, this revelation got included as section four, I believe it is, and it's printed the same way. And there we have it. Man, this is great. Is that the same one or is that a different one? Is that a different slide that you just shifted to? That, yeah, that's so the first one she had was the uh, actual uh, manuscript entry. And then, then we have the actual book that it came from, uh, original book it came from showing that. So Yeah, Maven, you did that so smoothly, I didn't even notice it. And mm -hmm. mainly because it looks kind of the same on the right side. Mm -hmm. But this is from, it was called Chapters in the Book of Commandments, Chapter 4, now it's Sections in the Doctrine and Covenants. But there you have the same language you can see. That I have commanded him that he shall pretend to, do, to no other gift, for I will grant him no other gift, period. Now, by the time that the first book of Doctrine and Covenants rolls off the press two years later in 1835. Now this language has been changed, so Joseph Smith can do more things. Obviously, he had been doing more things, but we've got to change this. And so if we look in the book of, oh, there it is. You can look in your own Doctrine and Covenants. It's section five, and in the Doctrine and Covenants, and I'm looking for it here. This is what it's changed to. Do you have that? Uh, can you read that, Bill? Bottom yep. right. I think that's really all that we haven't read yet. And you have a gift to translate the plates, and this is the first gift that I bestowed upon you, and I have commanded that you should pretend to no other gift until my purpose is fulfilled in this, for I will grant unto you no other gift until it is finished. It is strange, right? Like, if we believe that Joseph Smith is a prophet and God is talking to him, what you have to buy into is that God is not clear the first time around. God second guesses what he said because it could be misunderstood because He's the supreme being, and he somehow couldn't get his words out articulately enough, and uh, then goes back and retrofits uh, an old revelation with new language. Yeah, you get the idea that God can't see the future too well. No. So he, has he doesn't to go back see the and, problems. Yeah, he's got to go back and modify things. And yeah. the other thing is that um, uh, this also supports what David Whitmer said in his later years, long after he's left the church but still believing the Book of Mormon was true, where he says, after the translation of the Book of Mormon was finished, he, Joseph Smith, said he was through the work that God had given him the gift to perform. I wonder if that said, said he was through with the work that God had given him the gift to perform, except to preach the gospel. He told us, this is David Whitmer, he told us that we would all have to depend on the Holy Ghost hereafter to be guided into truth and obtain the will of the Lord. So it looks like David Whitmer's recollection is supported by the documentary evidence. But then by 1835, it's okay. Joseph Smith is not limited to translation. The wording has been changed. So now it's just until the translation is done. And now Joseph Smith can pretend to any gift he wants. Right. So, okay. So, yeah, so, so connect the dots back to the Church of Christ. Yes, please. Right. So it is possible that that's why Oliver Cowdery is receiving the revelation. However, Oliver Cowdery is bound a little bit. It's not just going to be an exercise in creative writing or creative revelation on the part of Oliver Cowdery. He is limited in coming up with these uh, ideas, these articles for the church and the church government and how it's to be uh, run to what has been written before. Specifically, hey, Dan, how you doing? Dan's got a comment up here. Yeah, he's going to go to Doctrine and Covenants section 18. Let me read what he says. Cowdery's revelation was a response to DNC. DNC 18 that calls him and David Whitmer to choose 12 disciples who would build the church by ordaining priests and teachers. Cowdery reversed that. Well, what, the thing I want to talk about here is section 18. I don't want to go too much into the 12 disciples part because this is already a bit of a tangent. But section 18 does appear to reference this where it says in 
verse 2, Behold, I have manifested unto you by my spirit in many instances that the things which you have written are true. By the way, this is dated to June of 1829. So right in and around this time. Wherefore, you know that they are true. Verse 3, And if you know that they are true, behold, I give unto you a commandment that you rely upon the things which are written. Okay, there's the thing, right? I give unto you a commandment that you rely upon the things which are written. Well, for what? Apparently, it's for this revelation in June or summer of 1829 when Oliver Cowdery receives it. So he has to rely on the things that are written. And he does. So when he, we're talking about the baptismal prayers, they're coming right out of the Book of Mormon. When we're talking about uh, manner of ordination, same thing. Method of baptism, same thing. All these things are taken from the Book of Mormon. So... Even though the revelation that Oliver Cowdery receives makes no mention of what the name of the church should be, it would make sense if he went again to the Book of Mormon, the things which are written in order to figure out what it should be. Right. And the Book of Mormon makes it very clear <laughs> yeah. that the name of the church should be the Church of Christ. Yeah. Third Nephi 26, 21. And they who are baptized in the name of Jesus were called the church of Christ. And even more than that, I don't know what slide it was we showed here, um, but it was the beginning with Cowdery. Maybe it was that, um, maybe it was this. Uh, let me sneak here to the next one. That's not it, but it was something we showed here before where he even, where God himself, right here, the rise of the church of Christ. So oh. DNC section 20, verse one, you have heavenly father or Jesus perhaps, but but one member of the Godhead giving a revelation to Joseph Smith and you have him giving a sort of tacit approval to the name because he's noting that it's the rise of the church of Christ. Yes. And not only that, this is the fulfillment of a revelation in terms of the day that the church should be organized because right. that was given in advance. You're going to organize this church on April 6th as well in church of Christ. Uh, for all intents and purposes, it seems pretty darn clear that it comes directly from the Book of Mormon. Yeah. And just to note, when we go back to 3 Nephi 26, 21, you have the Book of Mormon itself, and it's, um, again, this is when Jesus comes to visit. And they were baptized in the name of Jesus and were called the Church of Christ. You can't get any closer to calling the church by the name that they want you to call it by than to call it specifically the Church of Christ, which is exactly what the original name of the church was. Right, and we're all familiar with the passage in 3 Nephi 27, where Jesus comes down hard and heavy on the name of his church. He says, you know, it's got to have my name, otherwise it's not my church. If it's mo if you, there it is. And they said unto him, Lord, we will that thou wouldst tell us the name whereby we shall call this church, for there are disputations among the people concerning this matter. <laughs> And Jesus says, you shall call the church in my name. Now, by the way, I don't know if you have those um, original Book of Mormon pages. If you don't, I can hold it up. I don't, but yes. Good, because what I've got here is this. If you look at 3 Nephi 26, 21, by the way, I think most of the people who are watching already know this, is that the chapters that we have today in the Book of Mormon do not necessarily represent the chapters that were in the original 1830 copy of the Book of Mormon. There were fewer chapters and bigger chapters as a result in the original. And I wondered about that. If you look at 3 Nephi 26, 21, and then the admonition of Jesus, who shows up to clarify about what the name of the church should be called. Okay, let me see here. That's what it looks like. So the first part that is highlighted in orange is where it says that it's the Church of Christ. Okay, there is no chapter heading after that in the original Book of Mormon. In the Book of Mormon, as we have it today, the first highlighted section is the last verse of chapter 26. The next line begins chapter 27. But down there, that's where Jesus is talking about it has to be called after his name. So these should be referenced together. They're part of the same story and the same thought. And sometimes yeah. when you make additional chapter divisions, sometimes even verse divisions, it can skew the original meaning. 
So right. So third Nephi twenty six twenty one and third Nephi twenty seven three through eleven would have been same this part of the same original chapter in the original published Book of Mormon in eighteen thirty. And they're on the same page of the Book of Mormon. Yeah. And then so. we find again uh, further down in it in how it be same again same chapter same sets of verses uh, how it be my church save it be called in my name for if the church be called in Moses's name then it be Moses's church be called in the name of a man, then it be the church of a man. But if it is called in my name, then it is my church. And if it mm -hmm. so be that they are built upon my gospel. Right. And if anybody wants to know that's on page 507 of the original version of the Book of Mormon, it's chapter 12 of the Book of Third Nephi in the original. And to note, when we go further into the Book of Mormon, Mosiah chapter 18, verses 16 through 17, again, before Christianity had ever been invented, and again, as the Maxwell Institute has demonstrated with their new book, Ancient Christians, Jesus never set up original church anyway. But in Mosiah chapter 18, you and I were talking about this, verse 17, and they were called the Church of God or the Church of Christ from that time forward. Notice, by the way, and you pointed this out, God doesn't seem to care very much about what the name is specifically as long as it contains either God or Christ in the name. Right. Now, I look at this now and I look at it and I question, is this one of those places where Joseph Smith wants to amend what he just dictated, but he can't go back and say, that's wrong. I meant to say this. Okay. So he says, and they were called the church of God and he thinks, oh, church of Christ or the church of Christ from that time forward, which now makes it very strange. Okay. What was it called from that time forward? It was it called both things from that time forward, the church of God or the church of Christ? I don't know. But if we take it literally as this is exactly what happened and this is scripture, then yeah, it doesn't seem like God really cares if Jesus's name is in it. It can be the church of God as well as the church of Christ. Perhaps there's a tacit understanding that God means Christ here. I don't know. Yeah. As we get further along, it'll seem even more and more like God doesn't really care about the name of the church. So, yes. well, wasn't Joseph Smith? Sorry, just <laughs> coming out of nowhere. Is it wasn't Joseph Smith? Um, maybe at this point, still kind of a Trinitarian of some sort. So maybe it, it really is the same as he said this, whereas that was theology that changed mm, later. Great point. Maybe great point. Yeah, the the theology is certainly more of a Trinitarian view in the first published Book of Mormon, and many changes came. I mean. The Tanners in their book, Shadow Reality, point out, I think there was over 5,000 changes to the Book of Mormon, many insubstantial, but or unsubstantial, but it, uh, at least some of them were serious. And many of the changes in the Book of Mormon from the first edition to the second uh, and then on to the third had to do with uh, words that clarified more of a modern Mormon view of the Godhead rather than the original view Joseph Smith had when he translated. Right. So I think that I was aware, I know I was aware before you... Uh, broached the subject for the show of the name changes in the church that from 1830 from its formal organization it was called the church of christ that was the name of the church it was changed in 1834 four years later to the church of the latter-day saints dropping jesus from the title dropping, dropping christ from the title and then again in 1838 by revelation section 115 it was renamed the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints i knew that but yeah. when you said let's do a show on this i thought okay well that's pretty basic but then i thought you know i kind of know that broad outline but what i don't have any idea about is why why was the first name picked and we've already talked about a possibility for that the church of christ from the book of mormon but why was it changed to the church of the latter-day saints in 1834 and then why was it changed to the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints in 1838 I'm going to say right now about the first thought I had, which was when I looked at the church receiving the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by revelation from God in April, I think it was, of 1838, eight years after the church is organized. We all know that the current president of the church, Russell M. Nelson, is very strong on using the full name of the church. In fact, it's a victory for Satan if you call it the Mormon church, and God and Jesus are offended if you do that. What I take away from the history at a minimum is that it does not appear that God was that concerned about the name of the church being the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Otherwise, I would think he would have revealed it at its inception and not and then, make it the third on the list of names. Yeah, 
And, and then before you kind of go into some of the reason for the change, I mean, just note it, on May 3rd of 1834, Joseph Smith as moderator made a motion to change the name of the church to quote, the church of the Latter-day Saints, unquote. They already have the book of Mormon that told them to name it the church of Christ. They obviously were aware of it because what they named the church, the church of Christ. And then here in 1834, Joseph Smith, uh, as the moderator of uh, a group of early leaders, and we can even see the documents here. Um, I'm going to pull that comment off just for a second, Maven. Um, so you can see this time. This is the evening and morning star, Kirtland, Ohio, May 1834. I've got it boxed in. You can't really read it there. Um, but here is what it says. Minutes of the Conference of the Elders of the Church of Christ, which church was organized in the township of Fayette, Seneca County, New York, on the 6th of April, A.D. 1830. The conference came to order and notice, and Joseph Smith Jr. was chosen moderator. Frederick G. Williams and Oliver Cowdery were appointed clerks. After prayer, the conference proceeded to discuss the subject of names and appellations when a motion was made by Sidney Rigdon and seconded by Newell K. Whitney that the church be known hereafter by the name of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Now, it's a room full of people. Anybody could have raised their hand and said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Doesn't the Book of Mormon tell us that we should stay the Church of Christ? Um, it says, let's see here, uh, appropriate remarks were delivered by some of the members, and I assume maybe that's one of the remarks that was made, after which the motion was put to the moderator. Who's the moderator? But Joseph Smith. And passed by unanimous voice, resolved that this conference recommend to the conferences and churches abroad that in making out and transmitting minutes of their proceedings, such minutes and proceedings be made out under the above title, resolved that these minutes be signed by the moderator and clerks and published in the evening and morning star. And then it has Joseph Smith's signature. So it does seem strange that if God wanted to get involved, he could have got involved here. He could have got involved in the beginning with the church of Christ and straightened things out. And then this church of Christ or this church of the Latter-day Saints goes on for a few years before a change happens. And so somewhere along the way, God has plenty of chances to speak, and he doesn't really seem to get involved. It is strange on a number of levels, isn't it? The first name appears to be Revelation in the sense that it was likely drawn from the Book of Mormon, Revelation, mm -hmm. certainly. The third name gets its own special revelation and its own section in the Doctrine and Covenant, section 115. But the middle name of just the Church of the Latter-day Saints doesn't seem to have any revelation involved, but is a simple matter of a meeting and a motion made and seconded and then passed unanimously. Maven? Right. And just a shout out to CBS uh, for the 60 Minutes that was on. They called it the Church of the Latter-day Saints, if I recall correctly. Which which and, isn't uh, entirely wrong. A little chuckle when I, yeah. when I heard that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, didn't you get all, always so upset? Oh, there, Maven just left us. She can pop back in if she wants. What? But didn't we all that? get so upset? When there would be somebody on the news, like just happened with the CBS story and calling it the Church of the La of Latter Day Saints, and you go, you just took Jesus Christ out. What is wrong with you? Well, yeah, Joseph Smith so did, for, for heaven's sake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the part I didn't know at the time. I was getting incensed about it. <laughs> that for four years the church took Jesus Christ out of the name of the church. Yeah, and then just to know, we did have the original document here, but if I if I blew up the cut out. Uh, tan manuscript section there, the, the the piece of paper, it actually got really blurry. So it was better that we use this one here, but there is the original document. We'll have links in the show notes so you can go chase all these down yourself. Um, but man, such a, such a strange thing that you'll see as we get through this episode that church leaders are are so adamant that we get the name of the church right. And yet Joseph Smith isn't getting it right. God doesn't seem to care all along the way. And even a room full of people who have plenty of time to discuss that they're making the wrong move and God could give a revelation in that moment and there's just crickets. Yeah, and I'm having trouble believing that Sidney Rigdon just came up with this on the spur of the moment and nobody else knew he was going to do it. That's just me. Right, right. Uh, let's see here. What do we got here? What we have here, what we have here, and hopefully we'll be able to um, expand this a bit. We will. But we have some slides made from Dan Vogel's brand new book, Charisma Under Pressure, which is about Joseph Smith from 1831 to 39. I think those are the years. It's, it's supposed to cover the Kirtland. Great job, man. And, and Missouri, period. Yes. So he sent these to me. And um, let's see here. 
I can make two it bigger. Day, oh, thank you so much. Yep. Uh, two days later, this is from Dan's book. Two days later, Smith presided over a conference of elder, elders to discuss a change in the church's name from Church of Christ to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. According to the minutes, a motion was made by Sidney Rigdon and seconded by Newell K. Whitney that this church be known hereafter by the name of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, which was unanimously approved. The minutes give no reason for the change. So this is a question I have that may not ever be answered, at least not in the documentary record. Obviously, there's a reason, right? We've been the Church of Christ for four years in New York and now in Ohio and on and, in Missouri. Yes. And we were naming the church after the specific name the Book of Mormon said the church should be called. Yes. So why is it that suddenly they're changing the name in this fashion? Well, I don't think we know, but Dan gives us some interesting ideas for possible answers. Some have suggested that, that it was merely to distinguish the church from Alexander Campbell's organization, also called the Church of Christ. And that which, was the reason I had heard when yes, I was in Sunday school and lessons and this came up, it was always explained that it was to dif differentiate ourselves from the Campbellites. Right. And maybe that's it. However, Dan goes on, Dan Vogel, however, this does not explain why the Mormons felt a need to distinguish themselves after five years of converting and interacting with the Campbellites. It is also difficult to explain why a strongly Christian primitivist organization, i.e. the LDS church being built on the idea of patterning itself after the original Christian church, would relinquish the name of Christ, especially considering how the Book of Mormon mocked churches that took other names. And there he references the passage in 3 Nephi 27. Historian Michael Marquardt has suggested that the change may have been an attempt to frustrate the church's creditors in New York from taking legal action against them. This would also explain the dissolution of the United Firm and reorganization of the Kirtland branch, as well as the use of code names for the firm and its members and assets in the revelations when they were published the next year in the Doctrine and Covenants. This was only a delay tactic at best, but Smith was desperate and now to read these last two lines, we'll have to remove that comment. Thank you. Whitney had told him, that'd be Joseph, Whitney had told him on April 18th that $4,000 was needed immediately and another $4,000 by September. And there's no indication that this was accomplished. So maybe that has something to do with it. Another individual, and Dan Vogel had um, brought this to my attention too, I think his name was Michael McKay, a historian. He argues the other position and he says, well, okay, so if the church, if Joseph Smith is changing the name of the church to frustrate creditors in New York, why is he publishing the fact that they're changing the name of the church in the LDS newspaper? It doesn't seem like they're doing it on the sly at all. Yeah. And, and my only two cents was when they, when they change the name, everybody in the Mormon church or all the members reading the local newspaper are going to know that happened anyway. So there's not really any hiding it from the local area, but whatever creditors there were at some distance, perhaps it might've had some value at least for a little while there. Right. I've got a feeling though I could be wrong, but I have a feeling, a strong feeling that the primary audience and readers of the uh, messenger and advocate were probably members of the church. Right. And they're going to see the name change anyway. They're going to go to church the next Sunday and wonder why we went from the Church of Christ to the Church of the Latter-day Saints, taking Christ's name out when in our primitive Sunday school lesson in 18, uh, you know, 35 or whatever it was, like we suddenly know, 1834, we suddenly go like, wait a minute, we were supposed to have a name that was the Church of Christ, and now we're calling it something without Christ's name at all. But right. Joseph's very thoughtful on how he fixes this. Yeah, and and... This is fixed forever, historically, in the Kirtland Temple exterior, where the name of the church at the time when it was dedicated in 1836, i.e. between 1834 mm. and 1838, is the Church of Latter-day Saints. The Church of Latter-day Saints, yeah. That's what it's called on the outside of the Kirtland Temple, I believe. So, yeah. it's there. But then 1838 rolls around. Yeah, I just want to see what this was. This is, this is just another documentation, because it's also in the history of the church. So if folks had any doubts about the a messenger and advocate, uh, you would also be able to find it in the history of the church itself, volume two, chapter five, same information. 
Um, and so anyway, now we're up to 1838. Yeah, it says as part of that meeting, they discussed names and appellations. What I would give to be a fly on the wall to hear what that discussion was about. Yeah, but we don't get that. Yeah, but we get to 1838, April 26. Joseph Smith has just recently arrived in far west Missouri after fleeing with Sidney Rigdon from Kirtland because everything had collapsed there at the end of 1837. Probably a few were, more creditors looking for him. Yeah, lots of lawsuits. And yeah. some of them caught up with them. And, and anyway, but they fled down to far west. And now we get this revelation. Now, here's the important thing to know about the revelation, 1838, April 26, where God says the name of the church is going to be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yes, and to note that here we are eight years after the church, you finally get him telling us the current, sort of, current name of the church. But God seems to have changed his mind because he also seemed to be okay when Joseph Smith followed the Book of Mormon scripture, which was also revelation for all time and eternity, which was the church should always be called the church of Christ or another place, the church of God or the church of Christ. It's just hard to argue if you're in president Nelson's position, that this is something of the utmost importance to God when he doesn't seem to have cared about it for the first eight years of the church's existence. Right. Right. And so, uh, section 115, and here's the only other cool thing about this part of the story Section 115, if you were to go to your Doctrine and Covenants, look at section 115, verses 3 and 4, it will be uh, written in there, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, exactly the way you're used to it, which means a hyphen between the latter and the day, and the day would be have a lowercase d. But in the original revelation, and in the original way the church referred to itself all the way through Joseph Smith's death, was it... It, it went by the label of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but the revelation that God gave and never corrected until years and years later when Joseph dies, and it's not really God correcting it, there seems to be an admittance that it was done to get grammar into correct form. But the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had a capital D and no hyphen, and that's the revelation God actually gave to Joseph Smith. Right. And it was probably changed in the 1876 version of the Doctrine and Covenants, which I think was the first version or the first new version after Joseph's death. Yeah. And then you've got this other documentation from Vogel uh, regarding some vexatious lawsuits. Yeah, this is what's fascinating to me because now all of a sudden it looks like this overlong and burdensome name of the church that we've been stuck with ever since. The reason it's so long and unwieldy is because it's a compromise. And... You and I, at least I know I have, I think you did, we always had this question. Once we found out that for four years the church didn't have Jesus' name, and how do you square that with 3 Nephi 27? Well, we weren't alone because people at the time had the same issue. And among those were the dissenters from the church in Kirtland. At the time that they're experiencing all this apostasy and Joseph Smith's a fallen prophet, well, this is one of their articles in their complaints against Joseph Smith. And this is from, uh, once again, Charisma Under Pressure, Dan Vogel's new book about Joseph Smith during this period. And he writes, when Smith arrived at Kirtland on or about Sunday, December 10th, he found that Warren Parrish, Martin Harris, John Boynton, Luke Johnson, Joseph Coe, and other dissenters were trying to overthrow him and the church, denouncing its members as heretics for calling themselves the Church of the Latter-day Saints and were attempting to establish their own Church of Christ. They're trying to restore the restored church that went into apostasy. Yes, only seven years, eight years later, after yeah. it's been organized. Huh. Things happen fast. In a letter to her husband, Violet, I've always say Violet, other people say Violet, I have no idea, but Violet Kimball wrote that during Smith's absence, when he was away from Kirtland, there was a division, this is the quote, there was a division took place in the church, unquote, in Kirtland, and that, quote, quite a large party dissented from the church, being dissatisfied with the late reorganization of the church and with the heads of the church altogether. So they looked at the change of the name in 1834 to the Church of Latter-day Saints, or at least Violet Kimball did, 
as the late reorganization of the church. Yeah, it, it is just an interesting side note that the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints seems to, at least on some level, restore itself back to the original name by calling itself the Community of Christ, which community and church in some ways have a similar meaning. And so the Community of Christ essentially is sort of a synonym for the Church of Christ. Um, they seem to have gone back sort of to that those origins of what the name should have been. That's a very interesting insight you bring yeah. up. It had not occurred to me. Yeah. So here oh. you've got this situation with all these dissenters among the top leaders of the church about many things, but also including the name of the church. And now Joseph Smith leaves Kirtland in 1838 early, mm -hmm. gets mm -hmm. to the far west and receives a revelation from God, which now looks like it's going to be a compromise. Joseph Smith, or God, is going to be adamant on the Latter-day Saint part. But in order to strike a compromise, as maybe a tacit recognition that the dissenters have a point here, we're going to throw Jesus Christ in the middle, thus giving us this incredibly long name of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah, you, you, you said earlier, now we know where this God-forsaken long name that we all are being forced to say where it comes from. And it is interesting. If we go back to uh, this meeting, if we go back and see here, let me try to make sure. If we go back to, no, not that one. But when they go back to the, yeah, yeah, the Church of Latter-day Saint one. So if we go back to this one, um, in this meeting, there doesn't seem to be any effort to get a revelation. It just seems to be a bunch of people chatting it out in deciding with Joseph Smith's tacit approval that this is what it's going to be called. And now you have God coming in and God is perfectly okay changing it now to use both the man-made portion so that Joseph doesn't lose any face, right? And the and having Jesus's name in it, which is his requirement. And it's almost like God came in and smoothed things over so Joseph wouldn't be embarrassed. Yes, it looks like a very reactive kind of revelation, section 115, when you know the history before it, which once again, I got to thank Dan Vogel and Brent Metcalf for catching me up to speed on it. They are yeah. such wonderful guys, great authorities, researchers, the whole nine yards. But the key was not only that I could call them, but that I had the question, why? And as soon as I asked that question, why did it start with this name? Why was it changed in 1834? Then all of a sudden they just started letting me know all the stuff that they knew. Yeah. And we're not done. They gave you one more a piece of material here. Oh, okay, yes. And this is once again from Charisma Under Pressure. And this may repeat a couple things. We're just going to go to that bottom part. Um, let's see. I'm going to go halfway down through that, okay? Okay. If I can get the... And I should be able to read it if you can. Okay, go ahead, please. Are you talking about the revelation signaled? Let's see. This revelation signaled a change in Smith's plans for Caldwell County? No. If you can skip okay. down to the next paragraph. Uh, the next paragraph is the underlying part. So it says the revelation is also noteworthy because it renamed the church as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, thus combining the two previous names and responding to the criticism of the apostates. By the way, here's the church responding to apostates again, right? Uh, apostates who accused the church of forsaking the name of Christ. Marsh wrote to Wilford Woodruff in June 1838 and reported that the dissenters in Kirtland had established their own church of Christ, calling Smith and other church leaders heretics, and they wouldn't be wrong for changing the name to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Marsh argued that the dissenters did not understand that taking upon them the name of Latter-day Saints did not do away with the name Church of Christ, Still in a postscript, Marsh, Marsh announced that since Brother Joseph came to this place, we have been favored with a lengthy revelation in which many important items are shown forth, including the church shall hereafter be called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Right. Yeah. So I have no idea what he's trying to get at there, but he's trying to come up with some kind of apologetic that I don't understand. And that may not really make any sense, but he's got to say something because he's being an apologist for why it is Jesus' name isn't in the, in the name of the church uh, for that period of time. And that's where he says, 
that, um, where was it he says that? He says that just because Marsh announced that since Brother Joseph, no, it's the middle part that's not underlined. Yeah. Marsh argued that the dissenters did not understand that taking upon them the name of the Latter-day Saints did not do away with the name of the Church of Christ. Except it did. Yeah, except it did. So this is a typical apologist, non-answer answer. <laughs> it, 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 it wouldn't matter if it's there or if it's not, we still win. Yeah, exactly. In spite of the fact Jesus says, it's got to be in the name of the church. It's like Elder Holland. If I drive down the right road, that works. And if I drive down the wrong road, that works. Either way, I win. Heads, I win. Tails, you lose. Yeah. Or heads, I win. Tails, I win. Yeah. And then uh, here we go. This is the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with the lowercase d and the hyphen in between. I just want to note, because we often talk about how the early... Uh, revelations of the church were edited and altered by Brigham Young and others around him in order to, again, retrofit what they needed it to be in that moment back into the original revelations. And we we don't often get into the examples, but here's a great one. Uh, after Smith's death, competing Latter-day Saint denominations organized under the leadership of a number of successors, the largest of these, led by Brigham Young, continued using Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, capital D, no hyphen, until incorporation in 1851 by the legislature of the provincial state of Deseret, when this church standardized the spelling of its name as, quote, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, lowercase d with a hyphen between latter and day, uh, which included that, again, hyphenated, lowercase d, British style. In January 1855, the legislature of the Utah Territory reenacted the charter, which incorporated the church under this name. Now, here's the important part. In 1876... The LDS Church issued a new edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, which contains the text significant, uh, the text of significant revelations received by Joseph Smith. In this new edition, the first revision since before Smith's death, the capitalization, first revision since before Smith's death, should be after Smith's death. The capitalization and hyphenation of the church's name in 1838 Revelation of Smith was changed to reflect the name format the church had since adopted. And so again, we get the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, lowercase d, with a hyphen, but it's put back into the DNC as if God had said that in the first place. And the reality is it raises the question, why couldn't God have gotten it correct? Like he's so specific in the Book of Mormon that when Joseph Smith says a word and Oliver Cowdery spells it wrong, Joseph has to stop and then spell the word out letter by letter so that Oliver Cowdery spells the Book of Mormon word absolutely perfect. And then later on, Joseph Smith receives a revelation from God where he names the church, but somehow we shouldn't go with what he said. We should do it different than what he said. And then, you know, cry that someone pissed in our Wheaties when no one uses the right name of the church. Hey, RFM. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hey, how are you? I'm yes, good. Sir. Thank you. Good. That does make it somewhat uh, difficult to take seriously. It does. The latter day complaints about the name of the church being used and insisting that non Mormon people use the full name of the church. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, again, I can't say this enough. God wants Latter day Saints to be in the name, but it wasn't him that came up with that phrase anyway. It was just a bunch of people in a room chatting it up with Joseph Smith as moderator. Right. Okay. So but just I guess so he clear. sanctioned it four years later when he gave the full name of the church by revelation. And he's never upset that they got away from Church of Christ, which is the actual name that the Book of Mormon said the church should have been called in the first place. No, and if you take it to its logical conclusion, theologically, what this means if you cross-reference Book of Mormon, 3rd Nephi 27, with the name of the church from 1834 to 1838, is that this church was not God's church for four years. The apostates were right. They had the argument from the Book of Mormon. And once again, this why did they do it? Why did they change the name of the church? We've got some ideas. Was it to try and dodge some lawsuits temporarily? Maybe, but it's just this huge, huge question. The irony doesn't exactly miss 
follow miss or miss its mark when i noticed that the church reorganized its official business names just a few years ago uh, possibly in an effort to get in line with government legislation uh, led rules and in, and in, in, uh, policies so as to uh, be able to operate their investment funds appropriately. Mm, yes. Mm. The church seems to always be changing its name to catch up or stay in I front of so. those who are chasing it down. Yeah, that's interesting. It's very good. They're very good at this. So okay, now so on to what? Now we get to your thing, baby. Yeah, this is my favorite uh, part of this whole thing. And uh, I got, this is just one of these things I get really tickled about. So what's in a word Mormon? And, and the whole reason I wanted to go into the name of the church was because I wanted to show Hinckley and Nelson disagreeing with each other. And what ended up happening was I found something else that That's was much bigger. pretty, inc- yeah, much bigger, but we should at least cover some of this ground. So I want to note, by the way, Maven found this, this was really cool. And this just kind of sets the tone for this. Um, RC Evans was, I believe a member of the first presidency of the reorganized church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the community of Christ. And he was quite popular and he wrote, uh, a letter, uh, this is an interview, I should say, in the Toronto, Canada Daily Star, January 28th, 1905, uh, Latter-day Saint visiting Toronto, Mr. R.C. Evans, who is promoting the growth of his church in Canada. And he finds the term Mormon to be offensive, just like President Nelson does. And uh, he, you know, he does this interview, he, he speaks about how Representing the reorganized church as Mormons is disrespectful because we're not those guys out in Utah who are doing polygamy and and causing lots of unhealthy trauma to to its members. And what happens is that um, Joseph Fielding Smith, Joseph F. Smith Jr., Joseph Fielding Smith, future church historian who cuts the 1832 account of the first vision and then becomes the president of the church. And he's uh, Bruce R. McConkie's father-in-law. He in 1905, and he doesn't be he he gets uh, he's in the church historian's office working in there, but he doesn't have any official position. Uh, in 1906, he becomes an assistant church historian. In 1910, I think he becomes a member of the Twelve. In 1921, he's made the church historian. So this is before he has any definitive authority, but I suppose he was asked to respond to this. I can't. I can't see him doing this without anybody else above him knowing, but he writes and essentially um, comes down hard on R.C. Evans telling him, you know, the the word Mormon is a fond word in our uh, lexicon and that if you don't like it, you probably ought to get rid of the Book of Mormon and change the name of your church. And go ahead. Oh, yeah. I just wonder if we could bring Maven on to read the highlighted parts and she found it if she's... Ready, yeah, willing, yeah, able. That. What do you think, Maven? Yes. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so, okay, yeah, so just the highlighted parts. Um, I, before I read it, actually, I just want to say that I find it really ironic that the things that Joseph Fielding is going, is, is going to be saying to R.C. Evans that I'm going to read here is very similar to what the church is getting now that Nelson's done the same thing where he's taken uh you know the stance that it's an offensive term so I just find that really ironic um here it goes did you know that the term Mormon has always been applied to the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that the name attached to the church with the publication and promulgation of the Book of Mormon that it was first applied by enemies of the church as an opprobrium but that during the lifetime of Joseph Smith the martyr and ever since, it has been a term accepted by the church because of popular custom as, as an appellation. If, then, the name is so distasteful to you and your fellows in Canada and throughout the world, although it be on the grounds you have named, why do you not discard the Book of Mormon from whence the name is derived as well as the name? And then further down, really, I think it would be quite proper for those holding the view which you are said to have been express not only to announce the name Mormon as applied to the church, but also the book itself. So that's the end of that quotation from that section of it. But yeah, I think you could say that to Nelson just as much now. I think it would be quite proper for those holding this view, which Nelson holds that Mormon is offensive, uh, to renounce the Book of Mormon. 
Yeah, it's and, and as you pointed Smith against President Nelson. Yeah. Yep. And, and as you pointed out, Maven, the community of Christ did this very thing. They sort of renounced the Book of Mormon, and Eventually. they changed their name. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting to think about the implications of that, and if that's where we're headed. Yeah, totally. Thank you, Maven. Great find, by the way. And there's right, more to it, so, though. Like it, it keeps going. So oh, yeah, uh, this exchange, I think, I think we're going to have the link. It's on. It's available online. I actually had it in a book, and I'm glad it, I have it. But um, oh, it's, it's it says that my voice is coming through badly. Is it, it is. better, guys? I don't know. It's, <laughs> okay. it's, it's just every time you Sorry. take a pause, it goes silent, and it sounds a little like robotic in a way. But but I heard all the words, and I hope mm. most of the folks were able to make out what you said. So no biggie. Okay, hopefully. If not, it's on the screen there. But this whole exchange just shows how apologetics have not changed at all because Mormon was just the one one issue. They go into blood atonement, they go into polygamy and Adam God doctrine, and Joseph Fielding is not very honest. He's kind of slimy sometimes, but it really just sounds like things we still hear from just today. You mean the prophet, seer, and revelator of the church is dishonest and deceptive? In embryo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, because one of the things that was that blood atonement, that's one of the reasons that Richard C. Evans dislikes the term Mormon and doesn't like any association with that. And Joseph F. Smith's initial answer was to try to make blood atonement mean the atonement of Jesus Christ which we know that's not what it meant. And he knew that too, because he even brings up a capital punishment, like for the crime of murder. Um, because you can either, in those days, if you if you murdered somebody, you would also could face the death penalty by hanging or by um, by shooting squad. So he was basically trying to say, you know, if you're talking about that, then that's the law of the land. Everybody does it, nothing to see here. So, so he knows very well, but it was just such a slimy answer. There. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Yep. Totally. Um, Just ask it, Gary Gilmore. Yeah. It, it does seem interesting that all through the church's history, and, and I've especially, and you guys have especially seen this the last 20, 30, 40 years, and it goes back further than that. But whenever somebody's speaking on behalf of the church, they intentionally recognize what limited understanding their audience has. And then they deceptively obfuscate the truth based on what the audience knows so that the church doesn't look bad. And in the end, that just seems, again, I'll just say deeply dishonest. It just seems really, a really bad, unhealthy behavior. It is, but that's what apologists do. Yeah, totally. We're all used to it. All right. Thank you very much, Maven, for that one. Yes. And Great the thing is that it signals, of course, is that the apologist course, knows that, that, the if apologist tells, knows that if he tells the truth, yep. that it will look bad. Otherwise, the apologist wouldn't shade the truth or tell the truth, but tell it slant. So there's already that tacit recognition the apologist must have that if he or she tells the truth, it will look bad in order for that to be the motivation for them to change the way they're telling it. Right. Yep. And and again, the obligation of the true and living church, the only one with which the Lord is well pleased, and certainly he can't be well pleased that it's deceptive. It seems the only real behavior that that kind of church can do, a, a true and living church, is to be completely honest regardless of the consequences. That sounds like a song. I don't know. Yeah. Do is that a top what hit is hit? right. Let the consequence follow. Okay. What song? What what hymn book? What church's hymn book is that in? Because it can't be the LDS churches. I don't know. I was singing like Battle for Freedom and whatever. I was whatever that song was. I was I was mixing up the tune of one song with the words of another, maybe. It is amazing that the the hymn teaches us to do what the apologists and the leaders refuse to do. As seen in the SEC report. Yeah. <laughs> we don't really do what we say we do. It's hilarious. And then you and I are the bad guys for pointing it out. Oh, yeah. I've been shot many times for being the messenger. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's see. So 
just to go really quickly, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, President Nelson diminishing uh, the word Mormon. Uh, this would have been the October 2018 General Conference. I actually want the first one, so we'll do this one here first. This is Russell M. Nelson. He's a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. Uh, Thus shall my church be called, April 1990. And he just he just essentially does the same thing he does later on, which he says the proper name of the church is the one that God gave through revelation and we ought to use it. And as we're pointing out today, it wasn't the first name. It wasn't the second name. And it was eight years later. And God doesn't seem to care much, even in the book of Mormon, exactly what the church's name is. Uh, But he does lay that out. And then uh, in the October, 2018 general conference, after Hinckley has passed away, and we'll get to Hinckley's comments in a minute. After Hinckley passes away, President Nelson does the exact same thing again. It's almost a copy and paste, not exactly different words, but the exact same message being given, which is this is the Lord's uh, name that he's given this church. And I wanted to see if I could find here. He says to remove the Lord's name from the Lord's church. By the way, who did that first? To remove the Lord's name from the Lord's church. Sidney Rigdon (laughs) and everybody else. Yeah. Who was the moderator? (laughs) Yeah, that would be Joseph Smith. (laughs) Yeah. To remove the name, Lord's name from the Lord's church is a major victory for Satan. So all of all the victories for Satan, the most major of all the major victories for Satan was Joseph Smith himself removing the name, Lord's name from the Lord's church. Yes, and apparently Joseph Fielding Smith <laughs> yeah. arguing that uh, Mormon is the name of the church. And if you it's don't a- like Mormon, you may as well throw away the Book of Mormon too since it has that name on it. Badge of honor. President Nelson, badge of honor. When we discard the Savior's name, we are subtly disregarding all that Jesus Christ did for us. Shame on you, Joseph Smith. Shame. (laughs) Even his atonement, the correct name of the church was the name of the talk, October 2018. And I thought we would sort of wrap up showing Hinckley, but then we found something. And uh, what it was is a Times and Seasons Volume four, I'll, I'll zoom in here. I wanted to see if I had the exact date. It looks like it's May, 1843, May of 1843, Times and Seasons, volume four. And here's what we get. Um, and, and we can stop along the way or we can read it and then talk about it. doesn't matter to me. Yeah, I just want to say, first off, this is a letter written to the Times and Seasons by Joseph Smith. His name's at the bottom. We don't he have to go through it. all these gymnastics of figuring out, okay, who was the editor at the time? And even if he was the editor, did Joseph <laughs> Smith actually account. have a hand yeah. in this? No, this is a letter that is signed by Joseph Smith. This is not somebody <laughs> yeah. else. This is from Joseph Smith. Okay. So Joseph writes the letter. That. Yeah, yeah. Joseph writes the letter as a correction to somebody. We'll get into the, the context here. And then Joseph Smith then sends the letter to the church newspaper, the Times and Seasons, and says, hey, guys, print my letter so that I can correct the thing that somebody outside the church is doing. So to the editor of the Times and Seasons, sir, again, Joseph Smith speaking, we absolutely 100% are certain of this. Through the medium of your paper, I wish to correct an error among men that profess to be learn- learned, liberal and wise. And I do it the more cheerfully, because I hope sober thinking and sound reasoning people will sooner listen to the voice of truth than be led astray by the vain pretensions of the self-wise. The air I speak of. of, What's that? Take care of his quota for ad hominems. (laughs) The air I speak of is the definition of the word Mormon. It has been stated that this word was derived from the Greek word Mormo. Okay. He doesn't say why it is he's responding to this, but we know, and apparently Dan Vogel just got done telling me on the phone before the show, I I knew that Mormo was a criticism of the Book of Mormon from Ed Decker's The God Makers. I did not realize it was this old, 1843, and I think it was Dan who told me that it actually appears in E.D. Howe's Mormonism Unveiled. I mean, obviously it had occurred prior to Joseph Smith writing this response to it. Otherwise, he wouldn't be writing the response. But the Greek word mormo is of a, um, it's a female demon type spirit amongst the ancient Greeks. 
it was very much like a boogeyman, like um, uh, parents will tell their kids, like I always did tell my kids if they didn't obey, then the boogeyman would get them in the middle of the night. <laughs> because I always like striking fear. No, I didn't do that, actually. But, you know, we all know that idea, right? Well, the Greeks would say, you know, do what I say or Mormo is going to get you in the middle of the night. So it was this common criticism that the Book of Mormon is taken from the Greek word Mormo. And so it's named after a, a Greek kind of uh, demon. And that's what he's responding to here. Yeah. By the way, can I say one other thing before we go please, on? Please, please. Okay. This really needs to... You couldn't say enough things at this portion of the show. <laughs> There's so many things here. This really needs to caution us about if we're doing the apologetic thing and looking at, oh gosh, the names of the different uh, gods in Abraham facsimile one, you know, with the different canopic jars, and then trying to find some kind of a, a common or similar name spanning thousands of years and hundreds of different cultures to come up with something that seems similar, right? So we got, we got a bullseye and Joseph Smith really did know what he was doing when he was translating. This alone should make us be cautious because if the Book of Mormon and the name Mormon was not derived from the Greek word mormo, and I doubt very much that it was, the fact that it is a coincidence and it's a very close name should help us understand that similar sounding names in other contexts may also likely be coincidences as well. We should expect to find parallels and coincidences that have nothing to do with actually what's going on. Yeah, and I think this is one. Yeah. Maven. Is my sound any better? Because <laughs> first of all. Uh, no. Maybe. I just, it's when you talk, say, it's I've when you read a lot that it, that it highlighted itself. Go ahead. Mm. I just wanted to say I'm always I'm a fan of female deities and demons, and I loved Gene's comment uh, instead of boogeyman, boogeyman. Boogeyman. So, yeah. There you go. I'm sorry your yeah. your audio isn't doing so well there, Maven. It sounds like you're on the other side of the world or something. <laughs> All right. So Joseph Smith continues. This is not the case. There was no Greek or Latin upon the plates, which I through the grace of God, translated the Book of Mormon. Let the language of that book speak for itself. On the 523rd page of the fourth edition, it reads, And now behold, we have written this record according to our knowledge in the characters, which are called among us the Reformed Egyptian, being handed down and altered by us according to our manner of speech. And if our plates had been sufficiently large, we should have written in Hebrew, but the Hebrew hath been altered by us. And also, if we could have written in Hebrew, behold, by the way, he meant the Egyptian is altered because it's reformed Egyptian. And the but Hebrew has the been Hebrew, altered too. Everything's I guess altered. so. Everything. And if we could have written in Hebrew, behold, you would have had no imperfections in our record. By the but way, the can Lord, I just say please. That, that this whole, this whole verse was put in the Book of Mormon for one purpose and one purpose only. To cover his and ass when mistakes are made. It's to cover the tracks, right? <laughs> so nobody nobody can possibly make any kind of negative inference about the Book of Mormon because it has now specified that the language nobody knows and nobody will ever know, which of course raises the problem, which is why did he have to seal two-thirds of it to keep it from being read when no it one was could already read it anyway. written? Yes, yeah. when it was written in a language nobody could read anyway. Exactly. Yeah, and notice this imposes a tight translation. How do you mean? Um, there's no reason to make excuses for what the characters on the plates are if God does a loose translation. He can tell Joseph Smith whatever he wants. This only matters if it's a tight translation. Very, very good. I like that idea. Sweet. All right, which is called Reformed Egyptian, da -da -da Hebrew, but the Hebrew hath been altered by us also, and if we could have written in Hebrew, behold... You would have no imperfection in our record, but the Lord knoweth the things which we have written and also that none other people knoweth our language. As you point out, sealed portion, no need to seal it. No one can read it unless God tells them what's on it. Therefore, he hath prepared means for the interpretation thereof. And by the way, Joseph Smith couldn't read it. That's why he had to put his face in a hat and the plates weren't even in the room. And those are the means. Yeah. 
It all makes sense, though, if you just make a few allowances, as Terrell Givens asks us to do. Here, then, by the way, I'll continue. Here, then, is the subject, I'm sorry, here, then, the subject is put to silence. For none other people knoweth our language. So it's not Greek. It can't be Mormo. No. Sorry, I just interrupted. Totally. I think that's the point. No, you're good. Keep interrupting because this is the most incredible moment of, of my Mormon uh, research in the last few months. This is a uh, long drum roll. Yeah, yeah. For none other people knoweth our language, therefore the Lord and not man had to interpret after the people were all dead. And as Paul said, the world by wisdom know not God. So the world by speculation are destitute of revelation. And as God in his superior wisdom has always given his saints, whatever he had any on earth, whenever he had any on earth, it says wherever, wherever he had any on earth, the same spirit. And that spirit, as John says, is the true spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus. Here he's I rambling. May, I may safely say that the word Mormon stands independent of the learning and wisdom of this generation. Before I give a definition, however, to the word, let me say that the Bible in its wisest sense, widest, widest sense, sorry, widest sense. Okay. Let me let me make my screen full screen here too. All right. Uh, widest sense means good. For the Savior said, according to the Gospel of John, I am the good shepherd. And it will not be beyond the common use of terms Can I just to say, say something? that good. What's that? That's, I mean, he's already being so liberal in his interpretations because Bible does not mean good. Yeah. It's from the, is it Greek? Is it Latin? Jeez, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's all Greek to me. But it's from the word Biblia, which means books or library. Yeah. Yeah. He might be playing on that idea, you know, the Bible's the good word, the good word. But as you're pointing out, it doesn't literally mean that. Well, it's getting black and blue from how much he's twisting the Bible's arm a bit behind its back to make it be good. But yeah. there's method in his madness and he'll get there. Yeah. I am the good shepherd and it will not be beyond the common use of terms to say that good is among the most important in use. And though known by various names in different languages, still... Its meaning is the same and is ever in opposition to bad. We say from the Saxon, good. The Dane, good. The Goth, goda. The German, gut. The Dutch, god. The Latin, uh, what's that say there? Bonus? It's either that or boner, so I think we better go with bonus. Let's go bonus. The Greek, kalos. The Hebrew, tob. It's in, the, yep. in the Egyptian, mon. Hence, with the addition of more, which strangely enough, the Book of Mormon also shouldn't have English in it, the right. characters on the plates. Yeah. But he says, hence, with the addition of more or the contraction M-O-R, we have the word Mormon, which means literally more good. Yours, Joseph Smith. Right. So this is it's a remarkable um, lesson in his translation ability. And honestly, I don't know why he goes over so much of the stuff. Uh, by the way, he missed an obvious one, right? Because the Bible's called the good book. Yeah. Boom. Okay. Yeah. But that doesn't have anything to do with this point that he's making unless he's doing flourishes to show that he knows all these different languages. But he gets down to Mormon, and he's going to oppose the idea that Mormo is where the Book of Mormon got its name from, because there's no Greek or Latin on the in the plates, so it's not from the Greek. No man knows the language because it had was written in the Reformed Egyptian, but it had been altered, and only Joseph Smith can tell us what it is. And now he's going to tell us that Mormon literally means more good, because he's going to translate. I think he does pretty good with the different languages that he knew. But not many people, I don't know that anybody really knew Egyptian at the time in 1843 when he wrote this. And it is my understanding that Mon in Egyptian has nothing to do with good. Um, I looked it up. What is the word for good in Egyptian? Well, it ends up being Nefer. Now, if he had been talking about the name Nephi and said that means good in Egyptian, well, the apologist would be having a field day. And in fact, the apologists do propose that there is a play on words in Egyptian going on. 
that Nephi or the people of Nephi or the Nephites were fair and delightsome because fair is an alternate definition of the word nefer in Egyptian. But he missed it here because he's not going for Nephi. He's going for Mormon. He says mon means good in Egyptian. It should be said, by the way, Arfim, nobody, as far as I know, on the American continents knows that the, the Rosetta Stone code has been broken, but it's across the ocean and it only had just happened recently at this moment. Mm -hmm. And hence, nobody in the United States can translate Egyptian. Mm -hmm. So Joseph is imposing something that cannot be verified by anyone around him. And that is that mon, the Egyptian word mon means good. Right, and I have no idea where he's getting this. But he's certainly saying that the Egyptian, for good, is mon. Yeah. Doesn't it so, also seem strange? There's no Greek or Latin upon the plates from which I, <clears throat> I, through the grace of God, translated the Book of Mormon. But also, there's no English on the plates either. And he right. needs the English word more combined with the Egyptian word mon, which isn't actually right, to equal, literally, more good. No, it's absolutely, um, it's, it's ridiculous, if I can just <laughs> say that. He's taking what he believes to be an Egyptian word. He says the Egyptian for good is mon. I do not believe that's correct. But that's what he's saying. So mon, you've got the second syllable for Mormon, is mon, which means good in Egyptian, he tells us. And so the more part is not Egyptian, it's English. For more, drop yeah. the E, stick it in front of mon, and you have the correct interpretation, which means literally, he says, more good. And this is where we get this whole, I, I believe it's a famous saying by Joseph Smith. It was included in teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith that Mormon means more good. It's where the more good foundation gets its name from. Which is actually, as we can now connect the dots using English and Egyptian, is the Mormon foundation. Exactly. And I wanted to say that as strange as this seems, and I hope this is a good time to do it, as strange as this seems of taking a made up or even a legitimate foreign word and then putting an English word in front of it to make a new word, this is not the first time Joseph Smith has done this because some people try and say, some people, if you go back to the thing before, some people try and say to get Joseph Smith out of this predicament that he has stuck himself into with this, that he's kidding, that he's speaking tongue in cheek. But I think that when you read the entirety of this article and you, we, when you see he says, which means literally more good, it's, it seems clear to me he's not kidding. No, Maybe. and I think, yeah, go ahead. Oh, so, but uh, I want to hear what you have to say, and then we'll go to the next slide to show that uh, this is what he's done before. Yeah, and I'll actually put the original document up on the screen for the point you're going to make next. But again, the Times and Seasons is the church newspaper. Joseph is having this private correspondence with this non-member. He, he, he decides to request, and by request, it's essentially a commandment because he's Joseph Smith and it's his newspaper, really. Mm -hmm. So when he says, you know, fine, sir, please put this in the paper – it's going to make its way in the paper. Yeah. This is going to be read by all the members of the church. And he is trying to confound a learned, the learned people outside of the church. There's no context for which it makes any sense that Joseph Smith is trying to be facetious here. There's no context in which he's doing that. If an apologist wants to argue that, you have to flat out admit in the front of the conversation that you are taking the significantly uh, further irrational conclusion that requires way more allowances and conjecture that is such a distance between your answer and, and this conclusion that he's being is um, – he's trying to put it forth as if this really is what it is. And you can't really come up with any story in my mind of how you could – uh, I'll be like Kerry Molstein here. And I'm going to start with my conclusion. My assumptions are going to hold because you'd have to fight me tooth and nail to convince me that Joseph Smith is being facetious. It makes no sense. No, it doesn't. And the only reason they go there is because they have to, because they know that this is nonsense. Right. What Joseph Smith is saying is that more moan means more good, more in English plus moan in Egyptian. 
if he had gotten it right, the apologist would hold this up on the highest place of, of, of evidence of the church. Only because he got it wrong do we need to then create some new way to see Joseph Smith as not being sincere when he does this. Right. So let's look at the other thing, the modus operandi that he has yep. used. I'm going to actually add this to the stream. Let me uh, full screen this. What is this? So this is, it's hard to see, and we can show it in the other thing a little easier, but this is the, uh, this is a sample of the pure language uh, of Joseph the seer. This is where he's trying to capture the Adamic language. What is mm -hmm. the name of God in pure language? Amen. Amen. A-W-M-A-N. A-W-M-A-N. And, and this is where uh, Joseph Smith says that the name of God is Amen, which is going to find its way later on into Adam on the Amen, which is apparently Adam in the presence of God, using God's name in the pure Adamic language of Amen. And just so okay. that people can read it, I'm gonna only I'm gonna put it up this way. Yes. And it only gives a few parts of it, but at least it'll make sense. So here's the thing. Joseph Smith is trying to come up with a pure language that was spoken by Adam, sometimes called Adamic. And the question that's asked, and this was in 1832, so this is more than 10 years earlier before the 1843 letter that Joseph Smith writes and has published in the, the um Times and Seasons in Nauvoo. Question, what is the name of God in pure language? Answer, Amen. A-W-M-A-E-N. Amen. Question, what is the name of the Son of God? Well, the answer to that is the Son. Amen. And hold on. Does that yeah. make any sense? No. Well, yes, it does. If you track what Joseph Smith did in 1843, he takes a name that he has created, which is a foreign name, Amen, for God. And now to modify that to make it not God, but the Son of God, will take the English word of Son, S-O-N, spelled exactly the same way. And we'll say that the answer in the Adamic language for the Son of God is the Son, Amen. So you have a English front to a foreign language back, the Adamic language, which then proposes that the original Adamic language had English in it. Yes. Exactly. Now, I think this misses one because it also talks about what is humankind called. Let's see and if that we can is find it here. Sons Amen. Or mankind, it may be. What is the meaning of their words? What are the angels called? That's what? the Anglo man. Yeah, see, I just, I can't read this writing is the trouble. What is, what is man? This signifies sons Amen. Sons Amen. Where's that? Right, right here. Can you see my see, cursor? Sons Amen. That's man. Yeah. Man is Sons Amen because we're all the sons of God. So you've got, once again, you've got English in front of the foreign word, Sons Amen. That's mankind. The human family? Age, I'm sorry? Is it the human family, the children yeah. of men, the greatest something of Amen something? Yeah, the greatest parts of Amen. Yeah. So phenomenal. it's just the same thing. And when it comes to angels, that's called Anglo man or angles man. Yeah. Cause okay. English angels, if you go back far enough, eventually gets to the Adamic language, which is angles. Yeah. But all I'm trying to establish here is that this is not something new that Joseph Smith is doing in 1843. He's been doing this since 1832 is appending as a prefix, an English word to a made up or foreign word in order to come up with a new word. Yeah. And folks, if you're thinking this is the thing that I found, this isn't it. <laughs> oh, no, no. So, no. We're this doing this podcast in crescendo. Yeah, this is just the groundwork. So the question is, because originally I knew that Joseph Smith had done the thing we just showed. And then I was going to show Gordon B. Hinckley's talk where Mormon you know, it's something around the, the language of also means more good, but it's what Gordon B. Hinckley had to say that connects the dots to what Joseph Smith just gave us. And I'm going to throw up on the, well, I'm probably going to throw up too, but I'm going to put it up on the screen. Uh, Gordon B. Hinckley here. Elder Russell M. Nelson delivered an excellent address on the correct 
Name of the church. Okay, let me see. Yeah, go ahead and do that. And while you're seeing, I'll just go ahead and say that I was certainly aware, and I think most people watching are aware, that in April of 1990, Russell M. Nelson, you mentioned this earlier, came up and gave a very strongly worded general conference address about how God revealed the name of the church, and it's the long one, and this is how we need to speak of the church, and we shouldn't be saying Mormon. Now, fast forward six months to October of 1990, and President Gordon B. Hinckley is addressing the membership of the church on the same subject, except he's taking the opposite point of view. And he's going to say, we're never going to get people to use the entire name of the church. They're always going to call it the Mormon church. So in as much as we can't get them to change it, we need to, na we need to make the word Mormon shine with added luster is what he says. The name of this talk is Mormon should mean more good. And that's going to be the theme of his talk. He's going to introduce this idea about Mormon meaning more good, and we know where that's from, right? That's why we spent the time with the 1843 letter of Joseph Smith to the Times and Seasons. We all know it. I'm convinced that Gordon B. Hinckley knows it. But regardless of that, the theme of the talk is once he's established that, then he's going to go and talk about these great things that the church does and say, yeah, that's more good. Is, is not this more good? So he starts off here, and hopefully this will play better. But before he totally cuts off Elder Nelson at the knees. He does it in a very nice and diplomatic way. Immediately, right out of the gate, he references Elder Nelson's talk from the six months ago, says how great it was, acknowledges that it, this is the name of the church and it was received by revelation, and he commends the audience to reread Elder Nelson's talk from six months ago. And yeah, then he gets out the, the scissors. Okay, let me know if you have any duplicate audio or anything. I can fix that immediately. Okay. Six months ago in our conference, Elder Russell M. Nelson delivered an excellent address on the correct name of the church. He quoted the words of the Lord himself. Thus shall my church be called in the last days, even the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He then went on to discuss the various elements of that name. I commend to you a rereading of his talk. The Mormon Church, of course, is a nickname, and nicknames have a way of becoming fixed. I think of the verse concerning a boy and his name. Father calls me William. Mother calls me Will. Sister calls me Willie, but the fellers call me Bill. I suppose that regardless of our efforts, we may never convert the world to general use of the full and correct name of the church. Because of the shortness of the word Mormon and the ease with which it is spoken and written, they will continue to call us the Mormons, the Mormon church, and so forth. They could do worse. Can you hang on there for just a second? More than 50 years ago yep. when I was a mission. That is such a cute thing that he says there. Uh, they could do worse. And the genuine response from the audience there, and I respond to it too. And you can see he, he recognizes he got off a good one. He looks like I feel when I get off a good one. And you can interpret that way any way you want. But regardless of that, you know, back in 47, 1947, he wrote a book called What of the Mormons? So... This has been long-standing, right? What of the Mormons? It was very common. And now he's going to tell a story that's going to sound eerily familiar, although a little bit different regarding more good. And 50 years ago, when I was a missionary in England, I said to one of my associates, how can we get people, including our own members, to speak of the church by its proper name? He replied, you can't. The word Mormon is too, too deeply ingrained and too easy to say. He went on, I've quit trying. While I'm thankful for the privilege of being a follower of Jesus Christ and a member of the church which bears his name, I am not ashamed of the nickname Mormon. Look, he went on to say, if there is any name that is totally honorable in its derivation, 
It is the name Mormon. And so when someone asks me about it and what it means, I quietly say, Mormon means more good. Can you stop there for a second? Intrigue me, Mormon. Okay. There is no doubt in my mind, though I know we'll have a difference in opinion about this, Mr. Real, that Gordon B. Hinckley knows perfectly well that Joseph Smith was the source of the idea that Mormon means more good. He is going to avoid saying that in his talk, and he's going to ascribe this idea to a missionary associate. He doesn't say companion. A missionary associate he had 50 years ago, and he has this remarkable memory about this conversation from this uh, associate of his, in which the associate, unnamed, says that Mormon means more good. Do you want to say anything about that, Bill? So uh, a couple things. One is that as the audience is getting ready to listen to this, Hinckley is going to address what he was just told by his missionary associate, that Mormon means more good. And regardless of what's about to come, if he knows what Joseph Smith said, and if he does anything to disagree with that, we would expect him not to do so. We would expect the whatever's about to follow for him not to disagree with Joseph Smith. If he doesn't know that Joseph Smith said that, we could on a on a stronger level, trust his honesty about what he's about to say next. Um, and, and I'll simply note that by saying missionary associate, I'm, I tend to think it's somebody higher in authority mm -hmm. because otherwise you would say companion or the Sunday school president of the ward or, yeah. but he seems to want to protect whoever this was, or it, as you point out, it could even be made up so that he can address an issue that has nothing to do with any associate he was with. Okay, folks, we're there. This next clip is the clip that I could not believe that I had not noticed, recognized before this. Because, of course, I'm familiar with the talk. We all know this talk. This is where he gives Nelson crap about the name of the church, right? Six months later. Now that the stage has been set, listen to what... Elder Hinckley, President Hinckley, says about Joseph Smith's ability to translate Egyptian. His statement intrigued me. Mormon means more good. I knew, of course, that more good was not a derivative of the word Mormon. What? I'd studied both Latin and Greek, and I knew that English is derived in large measure from those two languages, and that the words more good are not a cognate of the word Mormon. What? But his was a positive attitude based on an interesting perception. And as we all know, our lives are guided in large measure by our perceptions. Ever since when I have seen the word Mormon used in the media to describe us in a newspaper, a magazine, or book, or whatever, there flashes into my mind his statement, which has become my motto. Mormon means more good. We may not be able to change the nickname, but we can make it shine with added luster. That's the money quote that we all remember. This is what <laughs> Bill Real was reading to me Monday evening. And I'm listening to him and I said, there's no way that Gordon B. Hinckley said this. Because if he said this, he's throwing Joseph Smith's ability to translate. And not just anything, Egyptian for crying out loud under the bus and so i went to listen to and you just heard it yourselves yes he said that i cannot believe he said that we have a president of the church who is saying that joseph smith could not translate for beans and he couldn't <laughs> translate egyptian for beans and guess what the book of abraham is supposed to be a translation of egyptian and guess what the book of mormon is supposed to be a translation of reformed egyptian what do you think about this bill yeah, in the Egyptian mon, meaning good. Hence, with the addition of more, sorry, with the addition of more, or the contraction, M-O-R, more, we have the word Mormon, which means literally more good. 
Why did you stress Escape the word literally? Feed me. Mormon means more good. I knew, of course, that more good was not a derivative of the word Mormon. I'd studied both Latin and Greek, and I knew that English is derived in large measure from those two languages, and that the words more good are not a cognate of the word Mormon. <laughs> but his was a positive okay. attitude based on an interesting perspective. Can we stop it here? Okay. <laughs> Please. Here's the thing. Okay. Two things that I can definitely draw from this is number one, that President Hinckley wants to give a talk with a the theme, Mormon means more good. Okay. <laughs> and just as important to him as that is to let the audience know that he's not stupid enough to think that Mormon <laughs> literally means more good. Uh, so going back to what we were saying before we played the clip at all, if Gordon B. Hinckley knows that Joseph Smith said that, he is sure as hell throwing Joseph Smith under the bus. And the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mormon too, I think. And if he doesn't know, if he, if he didn't know his missionary associate had gotten that from Joseph Smith himself, then we can trust Gordon B. Hinckley to be telling you what he actually thinks because he doesn't have an a conclusion to form his uh, assumptions around. Right. And as you put it to me on the phone so eloquently, if Gordon B. Hinckley does know that Joseph Smith said it, and I think there's no way he doesn't, but if he knows that Joseph Smith said it, he's tacitly setting up a 50 years ago missionary associate who's going to say it so he can gently chide his missionary companion for being a dumbass and not chide Joseph Smith for it. But honestly, I've known this forever that Joseph Smith came up with this idea that Mormon means more good. It's in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. I cannot imagine that Gordon B. Hinckley, who has written a number of books, including Truth Restored, has never read teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, does not know that this is something that Joseph Smith said. So it is just mind blowing to me that he threw Joseph Smith under the bus as far as his ability to translate, which is pretty darn important when you think about it in context of Mormonism. But the second part you said was, and if for some, and I give it like half a percent, that Gordon B. Hinckley doesn't know that Joseph Smith is the one who said it and it was just his companion from 50 years ago that he just remembers his conversation. Okay then he's still calling Joseph Smith a person who can't translate. He's just not aware that he's saying it about Joseph Smith. He thinks he's saying it about his companion for 50 years ago. Regardless of what he knows, whether it was Joseph Smith who said it or whether he doesn't know Joseph Smith said it, he's still throwing Joseph Smith under the bus as far as his translation abilities. Yeah, and, be, and if he doesn't know, then he doesn't even know to create apologetics or to ignore it. So hence, he is just telling you what he actually thinks without needing to protect Joseph Smith. Either way, he has completely admitted that Joseph Smith can't translate. <laughs> yeah, he, Joseph Smith can't translate Egyptian for beans is what the title of this talk should be. Except when we were talking, I said something other than beans. But this is what the president of the church Gordon B. Hinckley said in general conference, and nobody said anything about this? Yeah, I even created, I'm, I'm helping Craig Stapley out. I went ahead, again, forgive me, Craig, I stole your little logo there at the bottom and everything. I, I'm just doing this as a parody. You're welcome to recreate it in, in the artsy form and make it look nice. But the mistinsundayschool.com, I see a future one where Joseph Smith telling you what Mormon means and Gordon B. Hinckley telling you it's bullshit. <laughs> it is phenomenal. Yeah, let's, let's play it one more time. I can't hear this enough. The statement intrigued me. Mormon means more good. I knew, of course, that more good was not a derivative of the word Mormon. <laughs> because I'm not a dumbass. I studied both Latin and Greek. I went to school. And I knew that English is derived in large measure books. from those two languages and that the words more good are not a cognate of the word Mormon. But his was a positive attitude based on an interesting perception. Right, even Just, though he was totally wrong. But so notice, somebody, it's almost as if they're interacting with each other, Joseph Smith and Gordon B. Hinckley. He's saying, I've studied Greek and Latin, and I know that 
English is derived from those two languages for the most part, and that's correct. And yet, Joseph Smith in the same letter is saying there was no Greek or Latin on the plates. Yeah. And somebody here saying that we are straining at a gnat, but I'm going to tell you simply put, if you think straining at a gnat is showing that Joseph Smith doesn't have the ability to translate Egyptian, then you don't understand Mormon history and you don't understand the pillars upon which your truth claims are founded. I think this is a camel, not a gnat. No, to have you're not getting a, this one through the eye of a needle. To have President Hinckley say publicly and on the record, and we played it, that Joseph Smith could not translate Egyptian strikes at the heart of this church and its foundational truth claims. Yeah. You would have to need the conclusion in your heart to be true and then create an argument around it, like Kerry Molstein, rather than deal with the facts and the repercussions of where the logic of those facts leads. Once you recognize that Joseph didn't know Egyptian, as RFM just said, that the word mon is not an Egyptian word, and it sure as hell doesn't mean good. And hence, everything Joseph Smith gives us about Egyptian is bullshit. And Adamic. And Adamic is the same way. Which were very related in his mind. And he, if he's, they were all kind If of he's not a prophet here, and he's not a prophet with the Adamic language, and he's not a prophet with the Kinderhook plates, and he's not a prophet with the Bible translation because he took from Adam Clark's commentary, and he's not a prophet because of the Book of Mormon borrows heavily from 19th century material, and he's not a prophet on the uh, Book of Abraham because the papyrus that we have, that we know the stuff was taken from, doesn't match, then maybe Joseph Smith just isn't a prophet. And we know because a prophet said so. <laughs> 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 uh, Get out of that one. If you can't, you can't, that's the trouble. You can't, you can't get out of that one. How do you, how do you get out of that? Uh, again, if someone thinks we're straining at gnats, help us get out of that. I think we all need to sing together that great hymn, Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth. So this is, you know, again, the best we got is guys raising gnats from the dead, right? The best we have, yes. like that's what we're down to. The poor people in Africa pay your tithing so you can get out of poverty and gnats that I squashed come back to life. Yeah, I think a lot of poor people in Africa would prefer those gnats stay dead and the mosquitoes. Yeah. Uh, the Adamic language, there's the link for that. Uh, that's it. What's in a name? If anybody wants to call in, the, the banner is up there. This is big. This isn't just a small little thing, RFM. This is Gordon B. Hinckley. Honestly, honestly telling you that Joseph Smith couldn't translate. That seems to be a pretty big deal. Knowingly or unknowingly, it comes to the same thing. And I think the odds are above 99% that he did it knowingly, which, which is so weird. And I want people to weigh in and maybe call in with their ideas, including Dan Vogel, because if you can call in Dan, he's got a comment up here. The Stoddards believe Moroni taught Joseph Smith to be fluent in Egyptian, a reformed Egyptian, and that he literally translated the Book of Mormon. We were talking about this earlier, and I said, well, I guess the nicest thing you could say about it is if the Stoddards and the Joseph Smith Foundation think that Joseph Smith actually knew Egyptian fluently in 1829 when he translated the Book of Mormon, he appeared to have forgotten that six years later by the time the papyri rolled into Kirtland. Yeah. Let's listen to Kerry Molstein, because... The only way you can get out of this in Mormonism on this occasion, and by the way, not just this one instance in this episode, but three or four instances in this episode, the only way you can get through and still be a believer is if you go, I don't care how I get there, but I have to end with the conclusion that the church is true. And, mm -hmm. and I will always hold to that. And I will formulate my argument in any way I need to, no matter how weak to get there. And so I start out with an assumption that the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mormon and uh, anything else, <clears throat> excuse me, that we get from uh, the restored gospel is true. Therefore, any evidence I find, I will try and fit into that paradigm. I don't feel that I need to defend that paradigm. I feel that I want to understand the evidence that I find within that paradigm because to me it's a given that it's true. There are others who will assume that it's not true. And on these points, we'll just have to agree to disagree, but we will understand one another better when we understand how our beginning assumptions uh, color the way we, we filter all of the evidence that we find. Yeah, would you want, 
He just raised the white flag when he says, I'm not here to defend my presuppositions because he knows he can't. No. No. And, and, and honestly, if we had Carrie on here right now and we said, Carrie, does Mon equal good? And he would just tell you no. He would say, no, it doesn't. Now, he might have some other way to go, like, I still believe and here's why. And, but he wouldn't do that. And, um, and why would you put an English cognate with a um, Egyptian word to create another, a reformed Egyptian word, which I think is the the most charitable interpretation of what it is Joseph Smith is saying there? Because you've done it before. Yeah, and it was just as nonsensical. Ridiculous. <laughs> the, the first time. Yeah. But at least we can see it's something that he does. But this raises the curtain on this whole new aspect of Gordon B. Hinckley that I never even supposed was there. If President Nelson had done it, I would not have been a surprise because he's famous for throwing previous prophets under the bus. But here, it sounds like President Hinckley is knowingly throwing Joseph Smith under the bus. And whether... He is knowingly or not, it, the same conclusion ends. Gordon B. Hinckley, either way, doesn't believe Joseph Smith is a good translator. Right. And by the way, <laughs> when it was finally published, you know, a month later in the November Enzyme for 1990. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, they put in the two references. Let me see if I can't just show folks that. Um, Please click. do, because I, yeah, yeah. this is another evidence. I got 99% um, already. He knows it. This raises it to 99.5, I think. I just got to go back here. Mormon should mean more good. President Gordon B. Hinckley. Yeah, when you just look at the text as published on the church website. So when you go to this and you look through the talk and you go to that section, let me find it here, right here. Yeah, Mormon means more good. And then the reference, the prophet Joseph Smith first. This is what the parenthetical comment that's put in, in the printed version. The prophet Joseph Smith first said this. Let me rephrase that. The prophet Joseph Smith first said this in 1843. See Times and Season 4194. And Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, pages 299 through 300, which is where I encountered it back in 19, either late 78 or early 79. And then immediately following, I knew, of course... That more good was not a derivative of the word Mormon. I had studied both Latin and Greek, and I knew that English is derived in some measure from those two languages, and the words more good are not a cognate of the word Mormon. Yeah. Gordon B. Hinckley. Why? You and I don't even need to do what we do. All we need to do is show them doing what we're trying to do, which is show that Mormonism doesn't add up at every single turn. And these guys, the prophets, seers, and revelators, are contradicting themselves and throwing themselves under the bus, throwing each other under the bus at every turn. Right. And in a broader sense, what he's saying is that education trumps Mormonism. Science is better than pretending an invisible faith. Right. And now, by the way, Mr. Real, yeah. I still do not agree with your perspective. We've had this argument before about what the leaders of the church know and when they knew it. Right. So, I argue I argue that they know the church isn't true, and this is all a facade in the same way that David Miscavige is a facade for Scientology. Right. And I have consistently disagreed with you, believing that they do believe it's true, even though they're aware of a lot of the issues and problems, they resolve those in a faithful way. Even though I'm not willing to change my position at this point, I do have to acknowledge that this... General conference address in October of 1990 by President Gordon Hinckley is a point in your favor. Yeah. And and again, even if he didn't know, it works just as well. He knew. <laughs> he totally knew. But like you say, uh, if even if he didn't, it doesn't make any difference whether he knew Joseph Smith said it or he thought it was his missionary companion. The bottom line is still the same. He's still saying Joseph Smith couldn't translate. <laughs> I can't, you know, you and I multiple times this week had conversations where we just chuckled and were astounded at the fact that Hinckley said this. And no, again, we've all been pushing Nelson's words against Hinckley's words, and we're all aware of this talk. At least any of us have been in the church this long. 
Um, and again, a lot of the scholars, RFM, you did, I didn't, you knew that Joseph Smith is the one that said that Mormon means more good. And yet somehow, I don't think anyone has commented on putting all these pieces together and realizing that Gordon B. Hinckley actually threw Joseph Smith's translation ability uh, under the bus. Yeah, we, I've been so focusing so much on President Nelson throwing President Hinckley under the bus, I completely overlooked the fact that President Hinckley was throwing President Smith under the bus. Uh, yeah, and it, it is, you know, and Hinckley, of course, is saying to Nelson too, by the way. I mean, you can't you can't not understand this talk as being given to Nelson. But Hinckley is essentially saying, I'm no stupid idiot. Like I know Joseph Smith said that, but I'm I've smart. A couple of books. I'm educated. I know that this school. isn't a derivative of that. So like, I, yeah, you're right. Like we should stick to the name of the church, but Mormon, we ought to, we just can just get comfortable using it anyway. Yeah. And, and I think that what President Hinckley is suggesting, if we're to take his story at face value, is that he hadn't even graduated from college because he's on his mission. So maybe he's gone to a year, possibly two of college, and he learned enough about Greek and Latin in that time period to know that this was nonsense, that more good means more mun. Or yeah. vice versa, that more mun means more good. Somebody earlier in the conversation said that they thought they remembered something about the waters of Mormon being good, a good place. And I'm just curious if you know the scriptures a little better than me. And I'm just curious if you probably a lot better than me. If you do you remember anything about the waters of Mormon being referred to as good? Mm, I don't remember. It's Mosiah 18. So yeah. you can look it up. That's another Folks place where take it a says look. they call if you see just it, quoted yeah. that the Church of God or the Church of Christ. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure about that uh, being good being in there. Yeah. If that no person business. can look it up and maybe throw it up as a comment or call in, that would be great. Yeah. I and we do have a couple of calls for our audience and not do on the spot research on this issue. Yeah, and we do have a few calls if you're ready to go to them. Yes, please. All right, sweet. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take the banner down for just a moment and uh, let me start the first call here it looks like uh maybe Raphael. it's one of these anonymous ones so uh, i'm ready if i guess he wants to ask about our 990 this year or something or <laughs> all right michelangelo or donatello Raphael, are you there i'm not hearing you let me Raphael's check my called in before remember i made the comment about that being in the name of an angel yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. there you are yeah, my friend Raphael i can hear you here. now go yeah, ahead there. You're on Mormonism the, Live. The other, uh, the other Ninja Turtle. Gotcha. You're the other. You're the other no, Ninja. Um, you're everybody's least favorite Ninja Turtle. What are your weapons? That's what I want to know. No, no, Size. the red one's the best. That one's the best. Um, so I actually have two questions, one for each of you, but I mean, understand if I can only have one. Um, up to you guys. Go ahead with the first, and we'll 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 gauge it based on how the quality of the first question. No pressure. Okay. Um, so I don't know if this is. Um, really on topic, but um, so I, I've listened to all of the um, the lectures the RSM did back in the 80s, and I understand that there's like a 12th one got lost and everything. And you know, obviously, at this point, you know, views have probably changed, but I was wondering, um, I was really into, into them, and I thought that, um, would you in any world be willing to like recreate your 12th let? lecture or do you remember what it even had i was just like really left in a cliffhanger just wondering and it was the best one too no i'm sorry because i can't i, I have oh. no idea i know it was a wonderful tour de force conclusion of everything else i'd said proving for all time and eternity beyond a reasonable doubt that mormonism is true but unfortunately <laughs> it's lost forever so you'll just have to take my word for it Okay. Go ahead. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah go I have ahead no idea, but what yeah, yeah. Angry. No, I'm sorry. I have no I was very disappointed. Okay. Actually, I was so pleased that I had the first eleven lectures still after all this time that yeah, the twelfth one I would have liked to have had, but I was glad to have the eleven. That was quite a, a a thing, a feat you had to do. You had to go and order a special device to take your was it cassette tapes? Yeah, I recorded them on cassette with the idea of producing them in cassette for Tree of Life Productions. And uh, that fell through, but uh, I think they kind of went bankrupt or something anyway. But I have the, the tapes and my, the original tapes I had sent to them. It was a little mom and pop sh 
store in Utah someplace. And they had done a copy of them and they had sent them back to me with apologies, the copies that they had made. And they had their little labels on them. That's how I know that they're not You were this close to being Brad Wilcox before Brad Wilcox. I was this close to being Kyle McKay <laughs> before Kyle McKay was Kyle McKay. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. Let's that little it. shop hadn't gone out of business. You'd have been on the front shelves of Deseret Book within a few years. Instead, I got a one-way ticket to Palookaville. Yeah, co-hosting with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, caller, you get a second question. What's uh, what is it, my friend? Okay, thank you. Yeah, too bad, too bad. I'm gonna be left left on a um, cliffhanger, but um, I understand. Um, so the other one is for Bill. So um, I watched your chat recently with um, with Cara Burrell, you know, so whatever. Um, you described kind of the way in which you come to truth is kind of the same way in which like she deconstructed her mind and everything um you know but i was wondering like you said that you you could be wrong and what smart people might say so i'm just wondering really like when do you know that you've come that you've got to the truth yeah. and what is the truth in general yeah see in my again i only speak for myself inside my brain Raphael, the the evidence against mormonism is so monumental and the evidence for Mormonism is so sparse that I, I it would be it would be the equivalent of choosing to believe in leprechauns, choosing to believe in unicorns, choosing to believe in Santa Claus. Uh, no offense to our under seven listeners <laughs> that make up our audience. It, it is that. It's that big of a divide for me. So what I always tell people is I know what it's not. I know it's not Scientology. I know it's not Jehovah's Witnesses. I know it's not Mormonism. I've explored those religions enough to know they contradict themselves so severely that you have to set rational thinking completely aside and come up with excuses like Kerry Molstein to end with the conclusion that you want to. And so I don't, I, in my own head, I have zero room for me, I could, I could be wrong. The only way I could be wrong is if if God is one of these folks who really isn't involved at all, and all of Mormon leadership all through 200 years has pretended so, and somehow the church is still true in spite of that massive deception by the leadership. Well, I, I guess I mean like um, apart from Mormonism or any kind, any kind of like belief oh, systems, yeah. like in general. I, I think like, other issues. You know, do you have the totally. truth? Like, what is it in general? I think a flat earth is absurd. I think the evidence presented for a flat earth is uh, not convincing at all, but is a stronger position than Mormonism being true. I think the moon landing being faked is uh, not true. And yet uh, I would say that if someone goes down the rabbit hole and watches the data on both sides, it would be easier for them to be tricked into a moon landing being faked or the earth being flat than the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints being his true church. And, and so you can sense, but I would also say to answer your question that these kinds of rabbit holes where the election being rigged or the moon landing being faked, the people who put the argument for those kinds of things do a hell of a good job in the same way that apologists, if, a, if not pushed back, present things in a way that feels convincing on the surface to some it's for me, it's only when I dive into these issues in depth and then go to other experts and see how they answer the problem. So for instance, um, the fake moon landing, there's this debate about why you don't see stars when there should be, why the shadows are where they are. I wonder why you you don't see the moon in the sky. What? Yeah, you don't, but that's because they're on it. (laughs) So when you go down those rabbit holes, There are things that the person in favor of that side of the argument can present that you go, wait a minute, he's right, something to that. But if you then take it the next step and go seek out the folks who are intelligent and don't seem to have a reason to deceive you, then they explain the science behind why it's the way you're not expecting it to be. And hence, you're back to not believing the propaganda that says those things aren't real. But it's hard. I think on some of these things, it's difficult. It's why we can't all agree on everything because mm-hmm. 
these these issues sometimes are presented in such a way that even an intelligent person can be deceived. And there are intelligent people in the church who know all the issues, who seemingly still believe, and there's something that keeps them from seeing, even though in the rest of their life they seem pretty rational, in this particular arena they seem to struggle. Yeah, and can I add to that, that as an active Latter-day Saint, I spent a great deal of my time working very hard to deceive myself. Yeah. Even after you sort of knew it wasn't true, you kept telling yourself it was. Well, it kept finding reasons. Absolutely. It was a full-time job. Once things start falling apart, you got to try and use your spider webs all around it in order to keep it together and keep it from just completely falling apart. So that's a full-time job. Eventually, it becomes exhausting. And you know, tonight's show, I just think that tonight's show is as close to a smoking gun as I have ever seen about Mormonism not being correct because you've got a president of the church saying that Joseph Smith couldn't translate Egyptian. So what does that do to the Book of Mormon? What does it do to the Book of Abraham? What, is it, what does it do to Joseph Smith? And then yeah. what does it do to Mormonism as a result of that to Joseph yeah. Smith? All right, I let Raphael go. We'll grab the second call here. This is Becky. Becky, you're on Mormonism Live. Are you there? That's Becky. I let Raphael go. We'll grab the second call here. Becky, are you there? on Mormonism Live. I am. Okay, Hi. go ahead, my friend. All right. If you could, if so, you could turn um, off the computer I, playing it just so we don't hear ourselves in the background. You guys are great. Sweet. Um, I just think that if you are not connecting with PBM, you're basically preaching to the choir. Most of us are on your side. Can you well, can you turn down your radio or your your TV or your internet just so that we don't hear ourselves? I'd love to have this conversation with you. Yeah. You don't want to hear yourself. Well, I don't want to hear it. I don't think the audience wants to hear it twice. Okay. Sweet. All right. So my 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 point is, you know, um, I do believe in unicorns, and I think you guys are totally unicorn, <laughs> absolutely, like the rest of us are. But if you if you can't connect to the TBM, you know most of us who tune in, we're already on your side. We're there, we're right there. That's why all the chat is just like, you know, kind of like, hey, how are you, Maven? How are you, so and so, or whatever. So hopefully, you can find. You need to get to the TBM, and I know that's what you're trying to do. And I love it. So, yeah. Um, thank you. And can I just say, Becky, it seems like in part you're making a criticism, which is maybe we're being too snarky or harsh or making light of these things in a way that the TBM is going to see that their faith is being attacked and turn it off. And I don't know if that's what you're saying, but I'll, I'll simply say to that, I don't have any choice at this point but to be myself. And if I see something as absurd and entertaining and sort of laughable, I don't have any choice but to do that. And um, in the 10 years of doing this, uh, I'm going to put myself out there and be my authentic self. And I think that authenticity and sincerity and um, being who you are comes across better than trying to pretend to be softer so as to appeal to the believing Mormon. And I listened to that, and that's not what I was saying. Gotcha. I just want to make sure. I'm not I think saying some that at all. That. I, Sweet. I think you guys are awesome. Yeah. I just, I just, I, I don't know how you could reach out to the TBMs more because most of us who listen to you are already there. We're already on your side, and um, and that's all. You know, I mean, totally. We love, you know, it's we okay. love hearing Becky, you. Becky. It's a great, it's a great point. We're always looking to increase our audience. And I think that for the most part, Bill and I try to be respectful 
Uh, we're not out there uh, just always saying the church is horrible, awful in everything it does. It's not, you know, what's the latest atrocity that the LDS church has done, although they end up doing quite a few, at least newsworthy. But we try and be um, even keeled, fair, objective, as much as we're able, trying to follow the evidence where right the on. evidence leads. Right. I'm sorry, Becky? Yes, right on, right on. I, I'm not saying that. Yeah. yeah, I'm not saying that. It, so we I'm, depend on I'm you. Saying, we depend on my... you to to get your friends yeah. to watch the show, share this, and share on it Facebook. with your this, friends. This episode and bring was them monumental. In. Share it everywhere you know where to you know to put something. Put it on every social media venue that yep, you've got yep, an account. Yep, yep. Um, and I'll say too, Becky, we get helped a lot when Midnight Mormons, for instance, mention us. If any listener of them then starts listening to us. They're going to pick up pretty quickly who's actually going into the historical documentation and who's actually making the most rational view uh, known. And I got to believe, again, maybe not most of them, but people are funneling in as listeners by being confronted with the problems of the LDS church, seeing conversations happen elsewhere and doing Google searches or YouTube searches, trying to find those things. Um, I, I'm not... I'm not disappointed in the growth of our uh, viewership over the last, say, five or six years. It's done quite well, and Mormonism Live Absolutely. has done great. So, and I, and Becky, I will tell you anecdotally. The last, not, oh, sorry, Becky. I, I I'm not trying. To, I really am not trying to criticize you guys at all. I well, mean, okay. I, I, really, I feel like we're I, having a discussion about it. the issue. Yeah. And I think it's an important issue that you raise, and it's good that we're talking about it. I understand, and I think RFM does. We misunderstood you on the front end, and I think we're speaking to what you're actually saying now. Right, right. You know, I, I, I just, I, 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 I just want, you know, there, there are so many people who are who tune into you. We're already there. We're, yeah. We love you. We're, yeah. we're, we're fans. And how can, how, how can you? connecting to the TVM that's that's what's important yeah is is, is getting them to open their minds yeah. and and I I'm sure you know lots of people do follow yeah. you who who have opened their minds and so yeah. um but yeah now I do believe in unicorns and you guys are two wonderful unicorns yeah there are so. two there are two major and ways. I, I don't want to take any more time thank you Becky appreciate it very but much Becky thanks for Thanks. calling thanks for watching Share there us are, with your TV and friends. Yeah, there are two major ways that you can help us. And one is that if you donate to the to the nonprofit Mormon Discussion Inc. and specifically to Mormonism Live, you allow RFM and I to dissect historical issues for years to come. And if you want episodes like tonight where we find things, which we've done for the two and a half years, I think we've been doing this. For the two and a half years we've been doing this, if you go back and watch all the episodes, you'll see that we have uncovered things in Mormonism time and time again. And RFM's done plenty of that in Radio Free Mormon. I've done plenty of that in Mormon discussion. And here we are doing it together. The second thing is we've got a listenership of about 20,000 people on the podcast format and about twelve to 18,000 people on a good episode for the YouTube format. Um, folks, all you have to do is take the ones you love and share them, put them out there so that folks can uh, view episodes like tonight, which I think are amazingly influential when folks sit down to listen to what was talked about tonight and understand like, oh my goodness, like that's a serious thing going on in terms of Hinckley throwing Smith under the bus or Smith trying to add English words with other languages. The, the best thing you can do to get word out is to share the episodes uh, or to become a subscriber or donator to the podcast. Yeah, and so everybody knows when Bill said this to me, I was astonished. I was, and I remain so today, and probably will be for the foreseeable future, about what Gordon B. Hinckley actually said. But more often, Bill will come up with an idea and share it with me, or I'll come up with an idea and share it with Bill, and we have a, quite a candid relationship, and we'll push back against it and say, yeah, but what about this? And then it gets modified or diluted to the point where it we're not going to share it because yeah. it's not that strong yeah i can't believe this because i totally understand what bill is saying i understand what gordon b hinckley is saying and there's no equivocation in my mind 
there's nothing about this that says, yeah, but. It's yeah and in this case. That's why I think it's the closest thing to a smoking gun I've ever seen. Yeah. Sweet. Um, all right. We'll take one more call. This is, I believe, Jose. Jose, you're on Mormonism Live. Uh, go ahead, my friend. Hello. Yeah, I'm a true and living Mormon, and I'm listening. So, yeah, anyway, Jose, how are I you doing? I just wanted to say, you know, this is Gazalem. Gazalem Ali. And you're a true believing Mormon? Oh, yeah. I'm Gazalem Ali. I'm the prophet here and revelator of the new enzyme. But anyway, I, I've met, that name's I've as good met as Bill any. a bunch of times and stuff. He's seen my copper plates and things before. What language, are, I just what language say, is on you know, your copper plates? Um, both Adamic and Reformed Egyptian. Mm, good. I, you know, I, okay. I translated Reformed Egyptian and turned it into a magical alphabet. But I did want to just say that Hinkley definitely threw Joe under the bus on that one, you know. Because any good apologist, I've been listening to a lot of pseudo-linguistics from like Hugh Nibley and Daniel yeah. Peterson and those guys. And yeah. of, of course, from English shows up people. in Adamic because it's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> pseudo-honest people. But when you have like an eternal round of a, and a giant ring, I mean, English, Elohim's probably talking some kind of pseudo-English hybrid or something, you know? Yeah. It's just, that's the whole apologetic thing and how you how you can see it. It's all pseudopigrapha. Really look at it. Once you understand that so, Bushman said that the book yeah. of Abraham was pseudopigrapha, you, it's just a little tiny little movement to recognize that it's all pseudopigrapha. Yeah, and a little known fact is that when, um, when Elohim showed up in the sacred grove to introduce his son Jesus Christ to Joseph Smith and called him by name, he actually said, Jose. Ah, uh, Jose Ana. <laughs> Jose, Hosanna? this is my oh. beloved son. That's the thing. Is, Jose. That's what I always wondered is, you know, if, if, G, if Jesus, why does Jesus have a Puerto Rican name if he's Jewish? Yeah. Because uh, I don't know Hebrew if he was trying was out for West Side Greek, Story. And then into English. <laughs> oh, Yahweh. Yahweh or the highway. Yosef. Uh, <laughs> Yahshua bar Yosef. Jesus, son of Joseph. <laughs> thank you thank you guys all right love you guys have great, great episode day. yeah thanks have so a good much night. thank you thank you you never know who's gonna call in that was you never know you never know anything else my friend no but i think this has been just an incredible yeah. episode i'm still just vibrating over yeah. the thrill of discovery we we do have just one more quote from uh gordon b hinckley oh yeah here we go my dear beloved brothers and sisters, it is with a heavy heart that I come to you today. <clears throat> Excuse me. I come to you now with all open-mindedness and an open heart to tell you of the truth of the so-called self-proclaimed prophet of the Lord even Joseph Smith himself. I declare openly, this man was a fraud. He married other men's wives, took children to wife, practice in a, pra <coughs> excuse me, practice an abominable, <coughs> practice, 